Hello everyone, my name is Jesse Lawford. I'm the executive pastor here at Encounter Church and we truly have world-class ministry and we know that God is gonna do something through this message. So sit down, take notes, and see what God's gonna do for you. Like Mary so graciously said, uh, my name is Pastor Brevin. I'm the next-gen pastor here at uh, Encounter. I am uh, privileged and it is an honor to get up here um, to speak to you guys today. Um, Pastor Craig started his, his message last week, his series, and he'll be back next week to continue on his, what he started last week, but I'm here today. It's his birthday weekend, so if you uh, see him or, or reach out to him, get, uh, let him know happy birthday. He's out um, spending, spending some uh, quality time with some friends and family, so um, Siri is listening to everything I'm saying right now, and I don't know how to turn it off. Stop it. Okay, Perfect. All right, let me grab a couple things. Okay. All right, don't be intimidated. <laughs> it's, it's okay. All right. Okay. So we're, I'm going to do a little uh, things a little bit different today. I'm uh, the way that I that I preach and teach is is much different than Pastor Craig and even Pastor Jesse, and that that's okay. We we, we all have our differences, right? Um, and so today we're going to be. I'm just going to be going through on. Uh, a very practical um, uh, talk today about how to study the Bible. Um, I think it's absolutely important to for us to know as Christians um, how to walk through our 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 uh, sorry our the way that we read the Bible, and it's incredibly important to us. The Bible is the Word of God. It's the it's the logos, right? And it's it's. I'm going through a class right now in apologetics for in seminary, and I had to r write a criticism on a, um, a different world religion. I had to pick a world religion, and I picked, uh, there was a list of them, and I picked Hinduism. And I had to pick a criticism, and then I had to give my argument on why Christianity is, is a, better, a better alternative than Hinduism. And I, as I was studying it, I, I came to realize that there is no other religion that has what we have as Christians and in the Bible. I was looking up, I was trying to figure out what their texts were, what their sacred texts were, and they just don't, they have some, but nothing is like it. And then I started digging into Islam. It wasn't part of my, it wasn't part of my school in, or, or my assignment, but I started digging into Islam, and they, don't, they also don't have quite what we have, a, the living word of God that tells us the story of Jesus who came in the flesh lived a perfect life, and died for us. There's nothing quite like it. So that's why I'm giving this message today, because I, I believe that if we learn how to really, truly dig in to the Word of God, it is absolutely life-changing. So we're going to go back to the basics. We're going to do some fundamentals today, just like any sports team. If you've been on a sports team or if you've been a coach, going back to the foundation and the fundamentals is key to success. So... How to Study the Bible, a hermeneutical journey through book, uh, the book of 2 John. And don't worry, the long, I know, long hermeneutical, that's a long word. Um, we'll go to the next slide. What is hermeneutics? Hermeneutics is used to denote A, the study and statement of the principles on which a text, for present purposes, the biblical text, is to be understood, or B, the interpretation of the text in such a way that its message comes home to the reader or hearer. Hermeneutics is just that. It's just how to properly interpret what the text is trying to say. Because you can, there's many ways that you can read a text and take it completely out of context. And what we're, what we're going to do today is kind of make sure that we don't do that, right? We want to respect the Word of God and how it was meant to be read. So what is the Bible real quick? Like I said, we're going to go get down to the basics. The Bible is a library of 66 different books, written over 1,600 years by more than 40 different authors. Of the thousands of copies made by hand before A.D. 1500, more than 5,900 Greek manuscripts from the New Testament alone still exist to this day. The text of the Bible is better preserved than the writings of Caesar, Plato, or Aristotle. This is a historically reliable book, and that cannot be debated. If anyone ever tries to debate you, this is the most historically reliable book that you can find in the world. 
St. John of Damascus on our next slide wrote, All scripture then is given by inspiration of God and is also assuredly profitable. Wherefore, to search the scriptures is to work most faith and most profitable for souls. For just as the tree planted by the channels of, water, of waters, so also the, I think that's meant to be say soul, typo, sorry. The soul water divide by divine scripture is enriched and given and gives fruit in its season. Uh, in its season. And if I say something crazy today, I got off work at like 3 a.m. this morning. Um, so if I say something crazy, no, I didn't. All right, cool. All right, <laughs> sweet. All right, so we're going to break this down into five different groups or five different categories today on how to study the Bible. Number one, choose a translation that you understand. Very important. Two, understand the context. Probably the most important. Three, don't try. I, for, I keep forgetting we have a screen up, up and back. Uh, three, don't try to reinvent the wheel. Four, read slowly, take notes, and ask questions. And five, pray for help to understand and study with others. So we're just going to jump right into it. Um, hopefully this doesn't take too long. I want to respect you guys' time here. But number one, choose a translation you understand. This is huge. So let's look at, we're gonna be go, like I said, we're going to be going through the book of 2 John. And it is the second shortest book in the entire Bible. And that's why I kind of chose this book. Because if we walked through like Romans or, or another book, we'll be here all day. And I, like I said, I respect your time. Um, it's only about 245 words. It's one chapter. So when you say to John, and then the number after it isn't the chapter, there's no chapter denotation for the book of John. It's just verses. So let's look at 2 John, verse 5, and this is the King James Version. It says, And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. Yikes. Does anyone know what year the King James Version was written? And this is nothing, I don't have like really anything against the King James Version, but it was written in the year 1611. And I don't know about you, but I think the English language has quite changed since the year 1611. I think it's changed since this morning, right? It's, I mean, it's, it's crazy. So now let's look at a, a little bit more, and if you enjoy, like the King James, it's great. There's nothing wrong with it. But... If you are like me, I don't, I don't read like that. I don't talk like that. So let's look at more of a friendly version, the NLT of the same verse. I am rem writing to remind you, dear friends, that we should love one another. This is not a new commandment, but one we have had from the beginning. Just the tra different translation, you can understand quite what, what's going on here a little bit better. Um, and if, you, and if you're perfectly fine reading the King James Version, that's your translation, that's fine. You, you can read that. Um, I, wrote, I made up this little diagram about some of the more popular Bible translations and where they fall um, on like user friendliness. So on the left side, there's the word for word, and these are very like uh, word for word translations. These can be a little bit more difficult to understand. And then in the middle, there's more of like a thought for thought. A lot of the, a lot of the words like stay the same, but they, they make it a little bit more user-friendly. And then all the way on the right side, there's like the paraphrase um, versions, like the message, there's the voice. Um, and those are great for in their own context as well. So some of the, and I highlighted the ones that, that I like. They don't have to be the ones that you, you do, but word for word, you have the ASV, the NASV, the RSV, um, and then kind of in the middle between word for word and thought for thought, you have the English Standard Version, the New King James Version, the King's, King James Version. Then you have the thought for thought, kind of right down the middle. You have the uh, New International Version, New English Translation, the New American Bible, and then kind of in between that thought for thought and paraphrase, you have the New Living Translation, the NLT, which is what we use here quite a bit for our when, when we're preaching and teaching. Um, the New English, the, the New English Bible, and then the New Century Version, and then of course the paraphrase, um, the message. So when I'm studying the Bible, I like to, in in, let me just clarify when when I mean study, that's this is, there's there's a difference between if you're just getting the word in, just 
real quick, like reading the word, that's great. Just go in, opening the Bible, read, and go about your day. I'm talking about real time of if, if you have time to sit down and truly dedicate some time throughout your day to study the Bible, 20, 30, or more minutes. Um, and what I like to do when I'm studying the Bible, I like to have multiple versions open. And so I'll have the ESV most, most of the time, the NIV, and the NLT, and it gives me a good kind of spread of a different um, word for words or thought for thoughts. So, number two, understanding the context. So this is where getting a good study Bible will help you understand the context of the Bible. They're usually a lot thicker study Bibles, right, than just the normal um, Bible that doesn't have a whole lot of uh, commentary in it or anything like that. Um, so I, I tend to leave this at home. Uh, I don't carry this around much. Sometimes I'll bring it on Sundays, but um, I don't carry it much. So let's look at 2 John, verse 1. This letter is from John, the elder. I am writing to the chosen lady and to her children, whom I love in the truth, as does everyone else who knows the truth. Without context here, it would be difficult to under, understand kind of what's going on. Who is this chosen lady, right? If you just read this verse by itself, um, you may not know what he's talking about or who he's talking to. So... If you get a study Bible, and in most study Bibles, you'll have like this introduction at the beginning of the book. And I, I, if you're, so when you're studying, I highly recommend when you start a book to read through the introduction, and it really clarifies what's going on. So in this, in Second John, it says, ancient manuscripts uniformly identify this as a second letter by John. Due to the writing style, position, position in the canon, and theological, theological outlook, it is best viewed as written by the Apostle John. This document itself identifies its author as the elder. So this is the Apostle John who's writing this book. And then it says, John writes to the elect lady. This more likely refers to a congregation rather than an individual because much of to John is written in the second person plural. It is also questionable whether John would write to a female Christian that he and she should love one another. The phrase makes better sense if addressed to a church. So getting a good study Bible will get you that context of knowing what's going on, right? So he's writing to another church here and kind of giving them um, some, there's some heresies that are going on. This is written about like the year 80, 85-ish. Um, and there's a lot of heresies going on in, in, the, in the church um, about who Jesus is and whether he was fully God, fully human, all, all kinds of stuff. So if we open our ESV or not ESV, this is ESV. If we open up the study Bible, um, it gives us all these, these great methods on how to get that context right. So let's look at 2 John 1 through 6. It's going to be a little bit of reading here. This letter is from John the Elder. I'm writing to the chosen lady and to her children, whom I love in the truth, as does everyone else who knows the truth, because the truth lives in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace, which comes from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, will continue to be with us who live in truth and love. How happy I was to meet some of your children and find them living according to the truth, just as the Father commanded. I am writing to remind you, dear friends, that we should love one another. This is not a new commandment, but one we have had from the beginning. Love means doing what God has commanded us, and he has commanded us to love one another just as you heard from the beginning. Okay, it's pretty straightforward, right? Grace, mercy, peace, which comes from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Son, Father, will continue to be with us who live in truth and love. So let's look at John, 2 John 7. It says, I say this because many deceivers have gone out into the world. They deny that Jesus came into a real body. Such a person is a deceiver and an antichrist. Pause. Stop right there. That word, antichrist, right? That is a very uh, subject, a much topic and debate of what the anti antichrist is. And people over the years have gone way into left field about what the antichrist is. So this is another, re uh, another good way. If you're studying the Bible and you're reading and you get to this word antichrist, 
and say, let's, let's try to figure out what this means. And this goes right into our, my third point, which is don't reinvent the wheel. All right, don't try to guess what a particular word means or what a particular verse means. Um, there are many, many more intelligent people than you and I, no offense, that have put their life's work into understanding and interpreting the Bible, right? Thank the Lord for Bible scholars. They, they really, they, it, it, they're great. So let's talk about a resource that I use every time that I sit down to do a deep study of the Bible, and those are, these are commentaries. And some free commentaries online are Bi um, Bible Gateway. These are all websites. Bible Study Tools and Enduring Word um, Commentary. And a commentary is a detailed passage-by-passage -passage interpretation or explanation of the Holy Scripture. Like I said, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Bible commentaries are what you can bring alongside the Bible to help you understand what's going on. So, that's why I have these. This is a Bible commentary. I know it is absolutely massive. Um, and it has commentary on every single verse of the Bible in it. Uh, it doesn't even have the Bible words in it. This is just the commentary on the Bible. It's crazy. This is the, Ma the, the new Matthew Henry commentary. It's one of the more um, popular or user-friendly ones. So let's look it up. So since we read those verses, let's open this up. And by all means... I don't use these, I'll be, I'll be completely honest, I don't use these physical copies anymore. There are resources online where you can get these on the computer or on your phone so you don't have to lug around a massive, uh, some massive books. Um, and there's one specifically, if you guys are interested, it's called uh, uh, Logos, Logo, uh, Logos, um, and it's free. You have to buy like the resources, but if you just buy a couple Bible commentaries, they, they give you, they'll give you recommendations of what Bible commentaries. If you just buy a couple, some dictionaries, you'll be all set. You'll be ready to go. So let's look at it. Verses 7 through 9, it says, In this main part of the letter we find the bad news com communicated to the lady, for many deceivers have entered into the world, and your stability is likely to be tested. Notice the description of the deceivers and their deceit they bring in some error about the person of the Lord Jesus. It is strange that after such evidence as was provided, anyone would deny that lo the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. The charge brought against such people in verse 7, they delude souls and undermine the kingdom of the Lord Christ. The advice then given, they must be aware of two things. And it goes on to uh, verse 8, which we haven't gotten to yet. So he's saying... Practically, what the Antichrist is is whoever deceives and tells lies about the person of Jesus Christ. So if we look, another uh, resource that we can look into is a uh, Bible dictionary. And again, very massive, but it has pretty much any word you can think of that you can find in the Bible, and you can open it up, and it gives you the definition of that word. So I think I have it bookmarked here. Let's go to Antichrist. And it says, in the ideal or symbolic view, Antichrist is an ageless personification of evil, not identifiable with, identifiable with any one nation, institution, or individual. This idea gains support from, the, uh, John, from John's letters and has value in emphasizing the consistent, co constant warfare between Satan's manifold forces and Christ. So if we just open up a couple things, we wouldn't get this whole ideal of the Antichrist being like the single one person, right? Uh, Obama's not the Antichrist. Joe Biden's not the Antichrist. The Antichrist is not a single person. It's this ideal that has been around since Christ was crucified um, that, is a, that goes against everything that he taught. So any spiritual power or any, anything that goes against the word of God is Antichrist. So I think I had a slide on a, another definition. I won't read it for you. I, got, I read it in a different, a different one, but it just, for John, those who receive the truth yet teach false doctrine concerning Jesus are antichrist. So, right on to our next slide. I'm flying through this. I need to slow down. <laughs> it's all right. We might get out of here a little early. Sorry. Number four, read slowly, take notes, 
and ask questions. It's important to remember when you're reading the Bible to remember that it wasn't written about you. It is to you, but it is not about you, right? The Bible is always about God's love for the world and his redemption through Jesus Christ. Since it is to you, it's not wrong to read um, and see yourself in the story that you're reading and to see what God would have to say to you, all right? So it's not, it's not bad to read a story in the Bible and, and kind of see yourself in it. Just remember, it's not, it's, it wasn't written about you, but it is written to you. So let's look at 2, Don, 2 John 5 through 6 again, and let's just read, let's just let's read it slowly. I am, remi- I am writing to remind you, dear friends, that we should love one another. This is not a new commandment, but one we have had from the beginning. Love means what doing God has commanded us, and he has commanded us to love one another, just as you heard from the beginning. So when you read this slowly, I don't know about you, but there's a word in there that sticks out quite a bit right? And is the word love. So if you're reading this, you're like, okay, this is really talking about love, and I want to learn, I want to learn more about the word love. Maybe I don't have enough love in my heart. Maybe I'm not getting enough love from people, or I'm not giving out enough love. So how can the Bible, how can I use the Bible to build me up in this, in this, in this word love? A lot of Bibles in the back, I don't know about I don't know about this one, but at least in study Bibles, there's a concordance in the back that you can look up. It's like another dictionary-ish that you can look up a word, and it gives you every single Bible verse in the, in the Bible that will point you to what love, what love is or that talks about love. So let's go in the back of the concordance. Let's look up love, and I see that it shows us Romans 5.8. So we're going to turn to Romans 5.8. And it says, but God showed us his great love, showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And this is great. This this verse is fantastic by itself. Gives us the true meaning of love, what love personified in a person. But like like we said, we want to know the context. So let's read, let's just read the, uh, from the beginning of verse, or chapter five. It says, therefore, since we have been right, been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into a place of undeserved privilege where we now stand, and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We can rejoice, too, when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead us to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. When we were utterly utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for our sins. Now, more people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And now we were in Second John. We slowed down. We looked up the word love, and now here we are in Romans 5 reading this incredible passage about the love of Jesus that he had come and, and, sh- and showed us um, through his life. So let's turn back. Let's go back. Maybe you just can't get enough of this love thing. You just keep, just keep looking it up. Let's go back to the concordance. And look it up again. And I see that 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 13. And we're just going to keep reading. And this is very, most people know of this verse, but this just, maybe someone doesn't, maybe, maybe you haven't heard this verse before. And this is the first time you're, 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 you're reading about love. And it says, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. And it keeps no record of being wronged does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. Love never loses faith. It is always hopeful, and it endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Now our knowledge is is partial and incomplete, and even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. 
But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child of God, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But when we see everything with perfect clarity, all that I know now, know now is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely, just as God know, now knows me completely. Three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. And this gives you an incredible view, again, of, of what love is. And now you can go back to Second John, and you read Second John again. And now that you've got this just awesome picture of what love is, you read it again, and it just changes what you just read. The Bible is, is full of these intertextual connections. It's incredible. Even just normal study, Bible, if you're reading, and maybe you don't have a study Bible, but most Bibles will have cross-references down at the bottom. And I implore you, if you want to do this deep study of the Bible as you're reading, and it gives you a little note and it has a cross-reference, look up that cross-reference. You will be surprised at what incredible things that God will show you when you start just flipping through the Bible and it's, and it's interconnectedness. And it's all, every part of the Bible that's connected to each other, was all, it's all on purpose. Even though, like I said, it's written by 40 different authors, the way that it's connected to each other, it's, it's nothing but, but God, God inspired. You, there's no other way that you, you, could, um, you could see it. So number five, pray for help to understand and study with others. This is huge. The Bible tells us when we ask for the help of the Holy Spirit to have us understand that he will bring us understanding. So before you sit down and study the Bible, pray. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you something. It really will truly um, empower you with the desire, the patience, the discernment to recognize the simple truths of the Bible um, and understand the complicated concepts. Because, yes, the Bible can be complicated in many different areas. And it may seem intimidating at times, but remember that the Holy Spirit is there with you and to guide you through these difficult to understand passages. So I know I'm way ahead of time, but I'll have band come up as I as I close this out. Study with other Christians. Study with those that you do life with, those that you come to church with. Every once in a while we'll put on um, little Bible studies or little classes that uh, we have that we host here. Um, and I wish that more people would show up because there's nothing better than coming as a, as a community, as the body of Christ, to, to study the word of God together. So um, get in a Bible study. Get in a Bible group. It doesn't even have to be through, through our church. Um, it really does help when you get more heads together to talk about what, what's going on and what we're reading in the Bible. So the question is today, is what will God's word do in your life? And the answer to that is it depends on what you need. If you're hurting, his word, he, it will give you hope. If you're lost, it will direct your steps. If you're doubting, his word will build your faith because faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. If you're anxious, you'll learn to cast your worries on him because he cares for you. You will get a peace from heaven that you will not understand when you are hurting and you're looking for, for that hope. If you're trapped, he'll give you the truth that will set you free. I love God's word. I need God's word. And I crave God's word every single day of my life. that for you too. I want you to fall in love with who God is through reading his word. Like I said, there's, there's nothing in the world like this book. Nothing. No other religion, no other spirituality, no other person, no other group of people can give you what you can get out of this book. The Bible is what we get to put our hope in. It's the living word of God. There are Christians in the world that would give their life 
just to get a single page of this Bible. A single page they would give their life. Just to hold a single page of God's Word. And yet, sometimes we just leave it on our nightstand to collect dust. Just to sit down. There's a North Korean border guard. His name is Chin Mei. And he used his position as a border guard of North Korea to smuggle Bibles into the and he said, those who let Bibles into North Korea had, more, had a more severe punishment than someone who had committed murder. And he knew the consequences, but he also knew the life-changing power of the gospel. Chinmei was caught smuggling Bibles. He was forced to stand in a bowing position for 10 days straight. And if he, was, and if he moved out of that position, he would be beaten mercilessly. And he said, quote, sometimes as time went on, it was more comfortable to be beaten. By the grace of God, he was eventually released. And he went right back into smuggling Bibles in North Korea. That's how important. That's how important it was to him and how much he knew the importance of, of getting this word out. And I'm going to ask you that if you're going to be a serious disciple of Jesus, that you make his word a serious, a serious part of your life. So I challenge you to take some time over, I say the next month, using some of these study tools, there, or if not, that you don't, you don't have to, but they're there for you, to have some serious Bible study time. We push the first 15 here, like first 15 minutes of your day. We, we highly recommend that. But if you can go beyond that, to dive deep, 30, 45 minutes, an hour a day to study the Bible. I know lives are, our lives are hectic. But I'm telling you, if you spend 30 minutes a day studying the Bible for a month, I cannot tell you how much your life will be changed. Does anybody, anybody want to commit with me for a month to study the Bible? Maybe not 30 minutes. And if you can't do it, it's okay. But to study the Bible seriously every day for a month to change your life. Anybody anybody committed to that? Amen. And if you're not, if you can't do it, it's okay. It's okay. So God, I just pray. I pray for those who have committed to seeking your word, God. There is absolutely nothing in this world that is like your word, Jesus. You say, in the beginning was the word, the word was God, and the word was with God. We are holding a piece of you every single time we open up the Bible. God, I just pray that your word will touch us and change our lives, change the lives of those around us. Jesus. What we're going to do right now, if we have prayer, prayer partners, I don't know if we have anybody scheduled today, but if we have some prayer partners to come up for, that would be great. The Bible tells us that God's word will live for it will endure forever. And it also tells us that we will also live forever. Not in this body, of course, but our souls will go on for eternity. And I'm not going to hold back today. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. But we will live forever, either in the presence of God for eternity or eternally separated from God in a very, very real place called hell. Those are the two choices. There's no other choice. We will live forever. Our souls will go on forever. 
and that's the choice and that's the significance of the Bible and why we are given as Christians the great commission to go and make disciples of all nations because that's it everything in this life everything that we do it's going to end and then we're there and we're at one or the other to get into heaven for eternity? The answer is not by anything that we can do. It's because God came in the flesh as the person of Jesus. He lived his life without sin. He died in our place so that our sins could be forgiven. John 3.16 There's a reason why it's the most famous verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And maybe you don't know where you stand where you stand with God today. But that can change in an instant. That can change today. You can know for sure where you stand for eternity. So with eyes closed and heads bowed today if that's you, if you don't know where you stand today, if you haven't given your life over to Jesus, to surrender your sins, to surrender everything that you've done wrong in your life, to give it over to him, so you can be, be sure when the time comes, you know where you will be for eternity. So if that's you today, with eyes closed, heads bowed. If that's you today, if you want to give your life to Jesus, this is it. Like I said, there's nothing that you could do. Not a single thing. You can be Mother Teresa and just be an incredible person, but still not enough. Still not enough. So if that's you today, if you just raise your hand boldly in faith, if you want to give your life to Jesus today, online, if you've made that declaration to give your life over to God, message us. We would love to connect with you. It's not it's not the end when you give your life to Jesus. It's just the beginning. A long walk, an incredible walk with Jesus and other believers. And we're here to support you. And if you need prayer this morning, we have two incredible prayer partners up here who have both changed my life through their incredible intercessory prayer. If there's anything that's going on in your life, I, I implore you, please come up and get some prayer through these two incredible women. Lord, I pray for everyone that's given their life to you today, God. God, I just pray that their lives are completely change, that anything that has been bothering them, that has been lingering in their hearts, is just lifted off today, and they're just overwhelmed with your peace and your grace and your presence today, Jesus. God, we love you and we thank you. Amen. What an amazing word from God. Our prayer is that it impacted you as much as it's impacted us here at Encounter. So if this has changed your life, please like and subscribe to our page. Uh, also, you can message below this video and just connect with us. You can also connect with us on Facebook. And if you've given your life over to Jesus, we want to know about it. So you can direct message us on Facebook. There's a lot of ways that you can connect with us on our website. So we thank you so much for tuning in. And we're just hoping that you have a great day and that God blesses you throughout your week.